Yes, hello. Greetings from cold South Australia. Yes, I'm still in Port Pirie. It's, um, we're a couple of hours north of Adelaide, um, which I often liken to Jerusalem. It's a very large um, place and we're one of the far from country areas. Um, if you can turn to Genesis 1, we'll start there. I'm going to do a bit of a summary, I guess, on uh, God's plan uh, for us. And um, I've titled it as The Good Seeds. So if um, it's just come up several times in discussions with people that believe in um, evolution, I've always asked them how um, things continue on. And you think about a seed and all the information that's contained in a seed uh, is there as information for the actual plant that grows uh, to maturity. And so um, it's sort of like the story of the chicken and the egg and what came first. Well, the chicken came first and the egg was how things continued. And uh, I guess when we look at life in general, there's always a way that things will continue to be. And that has to be passed on from generation to generation of everything on the planet, pretty much. But here in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 11, it says, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the, the herb yielding seed, the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, uh, whose seed is in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. So that was the very beginning of things. And when you look at it, uh, it says there that the seed is in itself and uh, that it would go after its kind. And we pick up the story in verse uh, 26. Oh. And it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish, the sea, and over the fowl, the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God created man in his own image. The image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So we read there that there was a desire for God to create a people that were going to be like him. And uh, that was the beginning, the potential seed, if you like, was there for people to eventually become like God, which is a very big promise when you consider it. And the story goes on. Um, uh, in verse 31, it says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The evening and the morning uh, were the sixth day. So it was a very good up to that point. Uh, there was no problems with any of it. But then we pick up the story in Genesis 2 and in verse 4. It said, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created and in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and every herb of the field before it was grew and the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was not a man to till the ground. Um, and so we find here that uh, there wasn't somebody to till the ground, to actually work the ground, to cause these things to happen. And we find in the first chapter, it talks about Almighty God, but here it talks about the Lord God. So where God starts dealing and beginning his plan of salvation for mankind and somebody to till, to dress uh, the garden as such. And it says here in verse, uh, where are we again? Verse 8. And it says, the Lord God planted a garden east in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God grew every tree that was pleasant to the sight, the food, uh, the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So it put him in a situation where 
he had some boundaries as well because he told him that the day he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would surely die. And uh, that death process would begin from then. And if we uh, go into chapter 3, we're pretty familiar with these things. In verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the fields the Lord God had made. He said unto the woman, Yea, has God said, You shall not eat the tree, every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the tree, uh, the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. So she added a woman's touch there. And in verse 4, it says, And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And it says, the eyes of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So they Hid, in, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord from this particular time. And if you like, the devil introduced something that is akin to genetically modified seeds. Um, he modified the word of God. That was everything about it was very good. And all of a sudden it went bad for Adam and Eve and uh, for pretty much everybody on the planet. And it's interesting what the devil said. He said, you will not surely die for a start. Uh, but then he said, uh, your eyes shall be opened, which is a kind of enlightenment. You often hear in the world today is, uh, we have this enlightenment and you shall be as gods. In other words, you shall be like your own God and you'll be able to determine what is good and what is evil. And that's what we pretty much see around ourselves today it's this determination of what's right and wrong but not according to god's word so we know there was consequences for that and verse 15 it says uh, sorry and i will put enmity uh between thee this is talking to the devil and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Bruise actually means to gape or to wound, effectively to kill. Um, so somebody born of the woman would reverse this curse, would cause the death of the, the devil as such, but it would cost him his life. And unto the woman, he said, you will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Uh, to uh, sorrow they shall bring forth children and a desire shall be thy husband and he shall rule over thee and then Adam he said because thou hast hard, hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee saying they shall not eat of it cursed is the ground for thy sake and in sorrow shall it eat of it and all the days of thy life thorns and thistles shall I bring forth to thee and thou shalt eat the herb of the field and in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread and thou shalt uh, return to the ground for out of it thou was taken for thou art um, and unto dust thou shalt return dust thou art unto dust thou shalt return so if you look at gardening and I'm not a great gardener but I know that weeds grow a whole lot easier than the plants that you want to grow and it's toil and it's hard work and it's all of those things because the ground is cursed. And in a sense, um, it's like a genetic modification of that which is good. And uh, thorns, thistles and all of that. But the Lord promised that somebody would come to reverse that and uh, to put it right. So we'll go to Isaiah 53. So, in a sense, the devil introduced the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, which is not the fruit that we would want to have. Uh, and because of that, 
the way to the uh, tree of um, life was barred because of that. Um, this chapter 53 of Isaiah is uh, becoming popular amongst uh, even Jewish people that have re realized when you look at this particular chapter and they realize who it's talking about, it's talking about Jesus. And often they haven't read these prophets. And I've heard of some people actually turning aside from the Jewish religion and going after Christianity. I don't know exactly what form they're choosing that. But uh, when you read this whole chapter, I'm certainly not going to read all of it. I'm just going to read one verse or a couple of verses of it. It's obviously talking about the Lord Jesus. But in verse 10, it said, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Uh, he has put him to grief when, he, uh, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He, sh he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And so the promise here is that the seed that will come from the Lord's bruising as such will prosper. And uh, it goes on to say, uh, verse 11, and he shall uh, see the travail of his uh, soul and shall be satisfied by the knowledge Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. So we read here that he was to come and to reverse that particular curse. And um, he would see his seed prosper. So it's uh, a very, the scriptures talk about the husbandman and all of that. And uh, obviously we know that's the Lord and God himself. So John chapter 12, if we can go to the New Testament. And in verse 23, it says, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, which is very important, I say unto thee, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it shall abide alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that loveth his life, uh, sorry, hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. You know, so it's really saying there that a corn of wheat has to fall into the ground and die, otherwise it abides alone. And of course, we could see that as being a type of baptism, water baptism, of course. And to actually begin the process of that seed coming to uh, maturity as such, and I, I remember reading a story once about an Egyptian seed they found that was 10,000 years old and it had been sitting in some tomb somewhere and they put it in the ground and they added water and it grew. So the potential was always there, even over 10,000 years, um, but it was released. So it's really saying here to begin the process of growth in the Lord, we have to die to our old life. Um, the Lord's really saying that in these particular scriptures. And uh, the baptism is that death and the water and, of course, all of that. Uh, Matthew chapter 13. Um, the Lord often used parables uh, to describe spiritual things using a natural uh, application. And um, um, as you go along in the Lord, you, you tend to start doing that yourself in a way. You start using real life things to explain spiritual things. And uh, it's only really because the Lord did that. Um, here in Matthew 13, verse 17, it says, For verily, verily, I say unto you, uh, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see these things which ye see and have not seen them. And the hour, uh, sorry, and hear the things that, that ye hear and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. We know the parable of the sower and the seed, uh, but this is Jesus' expl uh, explanation to the disciples, which we are. Um, and it says here, and when 
any uh, one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which is sown in his heart. And this is uh, he which receives the seed by the wayside. But he that receives the seed unto stony places, the same as he that hears the word and, and anon uh, with joy receives it, yet uh, hath he not in himself, uh, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation and persecution arise because of the word, by and by he is offended. And he also received seed among the thorns, um, that heareth the word and the care of the world, deceitful riches of deceitfulness of riches, choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. He that receives the seed in good ground is he that hear the word and understands it, which also beareth fruit, brings forth some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. So it's talking there about that potential, that seed. Uh, the word of God gives us that seed and it brings our potential to the fore. But so many things cause people never to reach their potential. Uh, they get caught out by the things of this world. Uh, they get deceived by the devil. Um, but if we're in the good ground, and that's where we find ourselves, um, we can give, bring forth the fruit that the Lord wants to bring forth. And when we actually witness to somebody, we plant the seed. And then the Lord can start dealing with that person. And that's why it's very important to pray for them after they've received the word, uh, that the, they get through all of that and that they bring out their potential uh, to get through to the end. Um, hang on for a second. And it's very good. You know, the end result of that is very good, just as it was in the very beginning, what we read there. Um, and if we look here in verse 24, it says, And another parable he put forth unto them, saying, Kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which uh, soweth good seed in the field. But when the man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Uh, but when the blade had sprung up and brought forth fruit and appeared the tares also, and the servants of the householder came and said, Sir, uh, didst thou so good seed in the field from whence has his, its tares and he said unto them an enemy has done this and the servants said unto him wilt then um, thou then sorry that um, we go and gather them up and he said nay uh, lest while they gather up the tares ye root up also the wheat with them let them grow together until the harvest and the time of the harvest. And I will say to the reapers, gather up together first the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them and gather the wheat unto the barn. So, of course, it's a little bit like what happened in the garden with the devil. He came along and he sowed the tares uh, amongst what God had said was going to happen and what he promised to Adam and Eve. And uh, he's still doing the same thing. There's always an alternative view. And I, I find the world today to be a, very much an inversion. Um, everything now that's supposed to be true is upside down. And uh, it seems like the work of the, the opposition to sow tears amongst the brethren even. And uh, these sort of things are causing people issues. And uh, the Lord doesn't want that. He, what he did in the beginning was very good. Um, and we need to continue that very good plan onwards. Um, Matthew chapter 7, it sort of reinforces this a little bit. Um, before it, it talks about entering the straight gate, which we heard in the spiritual gifts and the narrow way. But in verse 15, it says, beware of false prophets. Uh, which come to you in sheep's clothing and inwardly are they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Men gather, um, do men gather grapes or thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit and a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. So really, the other side can't do anything good. 
and nothing good comes of it. But And it's all thorns and thistles over again. It's all toil and it's a, a curse, effectively. And the Lord doesn't want that for us. He wants us to bring forth good fruit so that others can grow also and know the Lord as we know him. Um, Romans chapter 8, just one verse. So I have, uh, we've got a music shop and I have interesting conversations with people that come in and often I find I'm counselling people I've witnessed to before and doing all of those things. And sometimes I wish they'd buy something as well, but they often just come in for a chat and we often get into conversations about whether we need to um, receive the Holy Spirit or not. And that's, um, I mentioned to a particular guy that didn't believe in speaking in tongues about uh, John 3 verse 8, where Jesus said, the spirit breathes, you know not where it comes nor where it goes, but the voice you hear thereof. So it's everybody that is born of the spirit. That's the Greek interpretation of it. But I said to him, you don't know if a baby's alive until it cries out and you hear the voice of it. And in fact, <clears throat> a doctor was saying a while back that um, when a child cries out, they make them do that because their lungs fill with air and they come to life. So without the voice of the spirit, uh, somebody's still dead and they're not born and they're certainly not born again. And this particular man didn't have an argument for that, which was good. Uh, but the reality of it is the Lord is telling us that we have to be born again. And I often travel to the Philippines in times past, and there's a lot of born again groups over there that are not actually born again. <laughs> and you have to go through the scriptures with them, even though they call themselves that. Uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, it says, this is actually the scripture that gave me the ideas for some of this. And it says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the spirit that dwells in you. When I looked up the word quicken, part of that says germinate. So in actual fact, the spirit that dwells in us will cause us to germinate, to become what we will eventually become. That the seed within itself. Uh, we will change and um, we will raise to meet the Lord and ever be with the Lord, as the scripture tells us. But it's a form of germination, if you like, uh, a springing forth of new life or different life. Um, so we'll go to 1 John chapter 3. Just a couple more scriptures. And in verse 1 of 1 John chapter 3, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. It's fairly obvious that the Lord doesn't, uh, the Lord knows us, but the world doesn't recognize us, uh, what we're going to be. It doesn't see our potential. And it says in verse 2, it says, Beloved now, are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he has appeared, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Every man that has this hope purify himself, even as he is pure. What an amazing promise that is, that one day we're going to be like him. And that's the fulfillment of what we read in Genesis 1. It's always been God's plan to spend eternity with the people that he's going to change to be acceptable to him. It's funny how the world sees that. We've had some notable sports people die lately and uh, there's pictures of them in heaven uh, having a good time and doing exactly what they did down on earth. And apparently that's the entrance to heaven is to play cricket for Australia or something like that. But <laughs> the reality of it is that um, they're saying that the, around God's throne is going to be exactly the same as it is down here. Uh, but it's not. People have to change. They have to fill their potential, yes, 
but we will be like him. And uh, what an amazing thing that will be. Just one couple more scriptures. Revelation 22. We started in the beginning, might as well finish at the end. And in verse uh, 14, it said, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right of the tree of life and may enter in uh, through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and war whoremongers and murderers and idolatrous, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So it's not great on the outside. <clears throat> and I remember reading uh, the scriptures before I came to the Lord and I realised that there was no way I was going to get in that city in the way I was and that something had to happen to change that. And so I pursued it and praise the Lord, I got um, baptised at the Vogue Cinema we just saw there before in 1989, as a matter of fact, and received the Holy Spirit back then. But um, I know now that you had, to, well, I knew then the revelation was given to me that I wouldn't have got into that city and I wouldn't have got anywhere near the tree of life. So uh, something has to happen for that to change. And just back to verse one of that same chapter, and it says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life clear and crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the lamb and in the midst of the street, it and uh, on either side of the river, that was the tree of life, which bare uh, 12 manner of fruits, yielded her fruit every month and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the Lord God and of the lamb shall be in it and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be upon their foreheads. So really, that's where we're ending up. That was how it began, in a sense, and that's how it will return. And we really thank the Lord for everything that he's done for us to give us a portion in these promises. I've very quickly summarised that using um, uh, horticulture, if you like. But the plan of God is an amazing one, and we've got our part, and all the people said. Amen.